This afternoon, I'll be taking the lead on the conversation and Michael will be joining in as well. If you've got questions on the Facebook Live, please pass them through as we talk to Ian. And also you'll find in Zoom that there's also a chat function in there. We would be more than happy to take your questions as we go through this afternoon. Now, Ian, I thought that we would kick things off on a pretty basic level this afternoon and talk about um, some issues around timing and planning. In response to the COVID crisis, there's been some conversations on sites about delay and loss in productivity. So it's really with that in mind that we've invited you to have a conversation this afternoon. There was some early thoughts um, that in response to the pandemic, there might be some shutdown of construction sites. It seems like, um, fingers crossed, if there's no second wave of outbreak, that we may, may possibly be through that threat uh, and also subject to observing uh, social distancing on site and, and those workplace health and safety issues. Um, but that doesn't mean that just because projects haven't been entirely shut down, that there hasn't been some impact on programming or some loss of productivity that should be accounted for. So if we could just start with the basics, what is a program? Well, Janelle, a program is a, a series of activities which are linked logically together, which you then calculate how long a project's gonna take and what sequence you're gonna do it in. Very important document. It started out many, many years ago as a management tool and it's still used that way. But there's also a lot of contractual ramifications these days to do with programming in time and obviously delay and as you spoke about disruption to sites. So there's a number of things which you can talk about with programs as things like activities and duration and logic and how they fit together but there's also a thing called float which helps you calculate which are the most important things which is the longest sequence of continuous activities which actually define how long your program, your work is going to actually take. Um, and that's very important, particularly when you look from a contractual perspective, where you have to finish by a certain time, otherwise you may suffer liquidated damages, or you also have your own delay damages, which will uh, quite often delay students. So from a practical perspective, I guess all projects start with a program. Where do you see uh, the wheels kind of fall off the programming for a project? There's a number of places where that occurs. Firstly, all programs need to be status and updated regularly. And by that, I mean weekly, fortnightly, and certainly monthly, where you should provide an update to the program which sets out what your bona fide planned works going forward are and even more importantly, recording the actual as-built progress to that point in time. Such as if you have a dispute later on, you've got that information available to you. Because I've seen in many cases uh, where in disputes that the programs aren't exactly updated properly or not regularly. I've had one recently where in a, a year and a half they had two programs and it's just a disaster trying to then prove somebody's case. And um, I'd imagine that by the time you come into it, I know for us, um, we'll come into a dispute sometimes at a late stage and our ability to assist is really um, guided by how good the data is or how good the record keeping has been in relation to a particular project insofar as what we're able to prove as lawyers and the dots that we're able to join together from a factual perspective in order to apply the facts to the law and make an argument. Is that similar when you're acting as an expert witness or giving expert programming advice? Like how important is the data that the project's collecting to what you do? Well, at the end of the day, causation is king. Um, not about correlation, you've actually got to prove causation. And the only way really to do that is to have your records. You've got to have factual evidence collected contemporaneously, meaning at the time. Nothing looking in a retrospective view and reinventing it, you have to collect the records at the time. And that is the biggest challenge for us. What about 
circumstances that projects those project managers that are sitting in on the um, chat this afternoon, if they're running a project uh, and there's no actual day's delay, so people are still showing up to work every day, um, but there's a loss in productivity or there's a feeling of a loss in productivity, what kind of data or information would you recommend that projects should be collecting in order to, I guess, save that information up for a rainy day? It might be the case that there's currently, you know, a good working relationship and a, a spirit of trying to work through this COVID period. But at some stage, there may be issues raised in respect of the dollar impact on the project at the end because of the productivity losses that are being, being suffered on site now. Is there anything that comes to mind? Well, I think you're right. In the, it depends on the project at the moment, and I think it varies, depends on who's involved. But mm -hmm. I think I suspect there's a bit of a honeymoon period, you can say that, at the moment because everybody's trying to get on, that when the rubber hits the road in terms of cost and losses down the track, that's going to be quite difficult. And disruption, I think, is what you're talking about, rather mm -hmm. than specific delay. Because when we talk about delay in my sphere, you talk about delay to completion. Mm -hmm. Disruption, which is about the direct cost losses for your trades. For instance, um, at the moment, limitations on Alimax, people getting up and down buildings, where you've got an operator who moves the, the Alimac up and down, and you have one other person in that uh, Alimac rather than the usual case where you might have, you know, six or seven people. So it's slowed things down enormously, particularly in startup and completion, smoke breaks, actually moving materials through the buildings, those sorts of things are going to come to light. So records wise, you need to keep strict records around where the trades are working, when, who's there and their movements. That's in terms of uh, written records, and photographs, regular photographs, and mm. putting out those photos, annotate them so we know what they're being taken of. Mm. If anyone has any questions uh, that is in on the chat, please feel free to post those questions in for Ian. Uh, Michael, you're getting a bit of a lag at your end, are you? Okay, we'll try to see if we can remedy that. Um, so, in and our neck of the woods, it's also important for the correct notices to be sent at the correct time under the contract. And again, I guess it's the circumstances where no one's giving anyone a hard time at the moment. Um, but have you seen before your ability to assist clients impacted by a failure to meet the notice provisions that are in contracts? Absolutely. It's, uh Although I'm not the lawyer, <laughs> how we usually deal with that is that for my position as an expert, I set things aside and say, I'd leave that for the legal opinion. But under my instructions, I will usually get to assume that those time bars and those provisions are, are met. But mm. there's always the argument about whether they've been, claims are properly made, notices have been given, and how that falls out. It just makes the job so much harder if notice provisions haven't been given. In your role as an expert witness, what would you say is the number one mistake you see made, say, by contractors um, or the, the party that's, that's executing on the work um, that you would say have, the, have your eyes up for looking out for this kind of issue? I think it, it is, goes down to that regular status, daily work status collecting that information along the way. So that is our most difficult. And it's the most time consuming thing for us to do. If we end up with a dispute at the end, and these things sometimes may be years after the works are actually complete, having to reconstruct that as built record based on bits and pieces of documentation and having to delve, not only is it time consuming, but it's very expensive. Mm. If, if contractors can collect that sort of information progressively, regularly and accurately, such that it can be presented to uh, the analyst for uh, expert report. It makes it so much simpler for us to do that. 
So it might be a resource during the project or an extra resource or part of an extra resource that needs to be invested, but the return on investment at the end for how much would need time and energy and money would need to be spent with an expert like you or with your team to be able to recreate that um, well worth the money at the front end to save the money at the back end. I totally agree. And it's either providing an extra resource or for management to take it on that they support their supervisors and foremen to collect that information in a way which can be stored and then recovered in an efficient way. And Ian, what kind of circumstances do clients usually get you involved? So what's the, what's the most, what circumstances do you end up getting involved in a project? Um, varies, it varies. Yeah. But substantially, it's either in the middle or towards the end of a project where we might be brought in uh, an expert role, but as a, what they term a dirty expert. <laughs> Coming in is not going to give testimony in court or an arbitration, but they're there to assist in putting together claims and, and trying to promote that through to uh, the other side. The others of that after that is after completion, and that's a substantial amount of my work, is after the works are complete and then trying to sort out what happened and why did people end up in the position they did. Again, that's so that's quite time consuming. And to be honest, like it's what I do, but um, for senior managers and those sort of people to be involved in those disputes post contract is uh, diverting a you know, critical resource away from what they could be doing and actually earning more profit for their business. So if they did it during the course of the project, they'll be far better off. Hmm. Do you anticipate that there is going to be um, any new issues that? you'll be assisting clients with in the post-COVID world or any um, specific challenges arising out of this crisis that you think the construction industry will be facing? I think there's a number of things that are happening. We've got the immediate productivity issues and people are getting used to the new norm as it currently stands and as things are released a bit more and things get a little bit more efficient again, but there's still going to be these constraints around social distancing for some time to come. So I think there's, there's a, an intermediate period where the, the effect of COVID is being felt now, but it's going to roll over into how infrastructure is going to be rolled out to support uh, the economy in the, you know, the next six to 12 months. And how is that going to be resourced from a government perspective? Um, how is that going to be sorted and coordinated with industry so we don't end up with a huge wave of potential work, um, it'd be better to do it in a measured way, I believe, and with consultation with industry. So that uh, happens in an effective way. Mm. I've heard you talk before about the um, dark arts of delay and disruption analysis. Can you tell our audience and give our audience a little bit of insight into what you mean there? Well, uh, it tends to be promoted as a bit of a dark art in terms of um, uh, program and uh, delay analysis. And there's, there was a good paper by Barry, um, who's out of the UK, and he's on a uh, senior committee there, uh, Society of Construction Law Protocol. And he wrote a paper a number of years ago, which set out the dark arts and commentary around that. And if anybody wants to look at it, that um, we should be able to provide it somehow. But it's, it's well worth reading because it, it provides insight into the magic and the tricks that might actually be undertaken uh, to try and um, disguise delay or, or in the alternative to set delays aside by doing some magic or mystery modelling within uh, a, a delay analysis. But for my part, it shouldn't be a dark art. It should come down to the facts, but those facts have to uh, come back to how much evidence we can, we can provide to those facts. Mm. We have a question from the floor for you, Ian. Uh, it is, do you have any general tips on how to minimise the effect of construction delays? Minimise. Depends what it is, obviously. Um, but it's, I think that regular status and, and keeping an eye on where things are at, um, not replanning on the run. I think everybody's tempted to, to look at the 
possibly the dollar value of deals that might be done quickly, but without quite understanding the consequence. I found it numerous times where there's been a deal done for a monetary amount, things like acceleration and the like, which then as they roll out, people find out that, oh, actually, we didn't put a program around that and we didn't analyse it in depth to see how we're actually going to do this. And they end up in more problems than they did in the start. I think a measured regular status and then response around where you're at in the project and then go through the usual contractual mechanisms and put the resources to it so you can do that. Mm. I found that there's been a more of a propensity or a acknowledgement of the money that can be gained through following the contract when it comes to variations but not the same kind of um, attention around the value of time and how um, that can affect the bottom line of a project sometimes even more substantially than missing the boat when it comes to putting in variations would you have any comments about that yeah, I totally agree because there's a, a monetary value around things which people are focused on. And this, not that it's wrong, but it's to broaden the view is that uh, the impact of variation, because variation by its nature, in most cases, is, un, is unplanned. So it has a disruptive element which may not necessarily be costed into the variation. Mm. And it's best as part of a delay or a disruption effect. And that tends to be what uh, then bundles it up. Some people talk about you know, the individuals' events. If you sum them individually, um, it's, uh, it's different to if you assess the whole of the effect of the group together because they interact. And having that uh, disjointed um, churning effect through projects causes disruption and loss. Either way, I think you're right. Variations are, are there for a reason, but the cost of the variation needs to consider the delay and disruption effects that it may cause. Has there ever been a time where um, you've been engaged or can you regular, regularly see um, the turning point in a project when you look at it from a programming perspective? So, you know, if only you could go back in the DeLorean with Michael J. Fox and do something different at that point in time, the entire project might have been different. Do you ever get that? You can do the TARDIS and go back would be a useful thing to do at many times. No, you can definitely see the progression and it, and it may be where the first third of the project, things are going relatively well, or so people think. Then there's change starts to occur and the effect of that starts to be felt. And you can see where these things are, are evolving touch to, they get to a point where the, the, the critical mass happens and suddenly there's a dispute because uh, the bottom line suddenly hits, things are starting to go backwards and that's where it comes to, comes to the crunch. And all people have seen as well is that people have a bit of a, a rose-coloured glasses view of the program and they'll program to meet the date, meaning they'll change the program's forward forecast Whereas before they might have been doing things sequentially, suddenly they're doing things more in parallel just to maintain the completion date. And I say you don't do that without having a real reason and somebody has actually done the calculation of what that means. Ian and Janelle, I'm back now. So for the people that have been um, watching this, uh, I've been struggling trying to figure out a technical glitch, but uh, I've got there. So. <laughs> I've been listening to everything you said, Ian, with one ear and trying to sort out the rest of it with the other ear. But and I'm, I hope I don't go over stuff that you've already covered and I've missed. But when we had the brief conversation the other day, one of the things that always strikes me when it comes to the sort of dark art that you're involved in uh, or the dark science is you must get incredibly frustrated when you see contracts maybe it doesn't, maybe it gives you a whole livelihood, contracts which set up certain behaviour and conduct and protocols and processes, and then you start seeing um, behaviour which is contrary to that. You know, the, the side, the, 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 the emails to the side, the, the text messages, you know, sort of which brings into play all sorts of different uh, or can be disputed behaviour or arrangements or conduct and things like that. So can you just 
you know, tell us a little bit about the pitfalls that, that can bestow businesses that um, don't keep a tight rein on what's happening real in a real in a real life sense on sites. Mm. I've seen over the last, like I've been doing this for 30 odd years now, I guess. Sure, not. Good <laughs> <laughs> God. <laughs> I the great beard appears. Uh, uh, and I've seen everything from the start of fax machines and things like that on site right through. Uh, and we've got to a point in an age where things are very quick in terms of communication and, and I think in some ways too easy. Um, for instance, uh, text on phones, uh, email, I find like as an expert in a defence sense usually works very well because people do things in email without thinking because it's simple and they think it's only a, 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 a one-off conversation that won't ever be seen again. But email can be deadly because people don't actually put the thought in before they hit the send button and the protocol should be in place within businesses where people don't do that. We'll come around and bite them and it, I've seen it numerous times where the smoking guns emerge and uh, it makes things very difficult. With the emergence of systems like Aconex, uh, people think that is the is the is maybe the cure-all but unfortunately people still use their Outlook accounts and email and personal email to exchange and it's usually in a more relaxed manner which is uh, not, is not <laughs> with the contract. So uh, those sorts of sources are, are really useful in discovery um, in a dispute. Yeah, okay. No, it's just from someone like I'm the non-lawyer of part of uh, the Helix uh, business. Um, so it, it always just, it always strikes me in terms of how easily a well-constructed contract, uh, even with, you know, with a well-constructed or an expert sort of contract administration team, it can all turn pear shape <laughs> with um, you know loose lips in ship, ship, so to speak, um, and so it's a sort of matey type stuff that I think brings a lot of people undone, and in terms of you know conduct and behaviour and things like that, and it's it just it's just so obvious to me that it's one of the greatest pitfalls that um, I don't know why you you know unless you can got that proper control and that type of train that training in place on sites in terms of the clear sets of delegations, you will not say this. You haven't got the delegation to say this. And, you know, or, if, or you, you follow the form of the contract in terms of the communication. It can just all fall apart so quickly. A lot of recent, just as an example, in the war stories, um, this is recent out of Sydney in a large project in Sydney. I was talking to some of the young guys there about it and I said it, it just provides me with, uh, it's, it's fodder for me. Uh, because of those issues around providing, uh, or sending that sort of information around because it, it, it comes out eventually. And the mates thing, it's great to have mates, but on the site, I've also seen, and I'm sure you know myself seen as well, when the stat decks come out, people say things in there will, and they will swear by it that this person said this to me on this day and then sign it off. They're not longer mates anymore and it makes it quite difficult. Mm. careful and measured in how and what we say and who we say it. Not that you're not friendly, you're just be mindful. Mm. Ian, we've got a few questions coming in on the question and answer. Um, I might start with one. As a principle, where contractors have started to make noises about delays but have never previously made an EOT claim, what steps should the principal start taking to help protect their substantial completion date? So apart from the daily status, what should they start to request from the contractor? Well, I think it on the head is, is getting their own daily status. The thing with requesting from the contractor, they may not necessarily get it anyway. Uh, they mm. are doing their own and uh, well, I would suggest that they do a shadow, shadow schedule and have an exercise being done in parallel with what the contract is actually saying and then collecting that data themselves and then once that's informed them of where things are at, they can then be asking particularly pointed questions of the contractor about information that they should be providing going forward. 
But it's all about getting that as built information and many shadow schedules for, for principal sides uh, just to monitor where things are at because we know the contractor may well be playing games with the, with the program, but it needs to be status and, and reviewed at the time to see what they're actually doing. We have a comment from Jared Mead, uh, who is in the Helix Townsville office. He says um, that on the issue of informal communication, that he finds that it's the same when preparing a contract. Emails um, in negotiating contracts should ideally not be included in the contract for the same reason. They are imprecise, can be inconsistent with other rights and can come back to bite you. So just a great tip there from Jared Mead in our Townsville office as well. Thank you for that, Jared. Another question for you, Ian. Um, we often hear that individual variations do not have an impact on the program, but when there are a hundred odd changes, um, the sheer volume and timing of those changes would have an impact, but is notoriously difficult to prove to a client. Do you have a solution on how to overcome such a scenario? It is quite difficult because it's factually dense. So you've got lots of individual variations occurring regularly. <coughs> Excuse me. So again, I think you need to be able to plot where your resources are being applied and how those interactions are being disrupted. I know it's difficult and it is notorious, but that's the only real way to do it is to, to properly plot what's going on and what trades are being affected and how their interactions are being affected. And take photos, keep records. See if you can do it that way. There's methodologies around earned value and earnable value, those sorts of things. But they tend to be uh, uh, a little bit too scientific and they're, uh, again, it's more about correlation rather than causation. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you need to be able to show what in, one impacted on the other. But I understand it is quite difficult when you're getting a lot of change happening at one time. Mm. Putting on your hat as a mediator and I guess also as an expert witness, another question that we have from the floor is to ask you if you've experienced any development or change in the way the courts assess delay claims? Um, there's a, there's always changing, but there is some pivotal sort of cases that have happened in the last 10 years and around it. One of the most recent was a white construction case out of Sydney, which has been grabbed by numerous people, but I might just make a, just an initial comment around that. I know the, the expert who assisted in that, in terms of the judge, um, but that case was a common law case, um, which means uh, as opposed to a, a usual construction contract, there was a, where there's an EAT provision and that then guides the court on how this uh, extensions of time should be and delay should be assessed. White Constructions was quite different to that because it wasn't about uh, a construction contract per se. It was about a general damages claim. Um, that would then, if it, under a general damages claim, you'd have to then prove it with causation, which is an as planned, as built exercise to try and prove that, but for the events that you're claiming, you, know, you would have been, uh, I, you would have been caused the damage that, that you're alleging. As opposed to a construction contract, which in the case of something like uh, Wicket, which was a, a recent, more recent decision, which set about how the contract was structured and spe specifically what methodology should be used in uh, the calculation of extensions of time, for instance. They use what they call a prospective method under that contract, which means a forward looking uh, view. You impact programs based on particular points in time to assess delay rather than a retrospective, which is looking back after the fact and then trying to reconstruct what happened. So they're quite different in how they, uh, they sit together. So there's been quite a number of pivotal, pivotal changes over the time. But say the time impact analysis type uh, perspective view is being less favoured, but it really comes down to the contract. I have one, had one recently, which is express under the contract it says you will use a time impact analysis so as an expert you will use a time act time impacted analysis it's what the contract mm -hmm. i guess that comes back down to um looking at the contract negotiations at the outset as well and understanding how important the negotiations are that happen around those 
provisions that deal with time and programming as much as any other provision of the contract. You need to look at it and understand what they actually mean uh, from both a principal and a contractor's perspective. Because um, there is some views that are like a time impact perspective analysis is a bit contractor friendly in some ways. But there's also this, which you'd be able to explain better than I, Janelle and Michael, as the prevention principle, which is in my simple terms is that uh, uh, somebody or the principal has done something um, such that the contractor couldn't finish any earlier than a particular point in time. So they shouldn't suffer liquidated damages. I go in, you could be the lawyer. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Hey? <laughs> but it's, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing how when you strip, you know, back what you do as an expert, eh, and what you do as general as a lawyer, it, the, the, the common underwriting issue that causes a dispute is what I call treatment of time. It's, it's, because <laughs> I suppose, yeah, it doesn't make, it's not, time equals money. So you can always understand why time is going to be at the centre of just about every significant, certainly payment dispute that I see. Um, and it just, it's, it's sort of ignored in the, in the early contractual stages when you, people think, oh, yeah, I can do that, I can do that, yeah, I'll take it on. But um, boy, oh boy, it just manifests itself into a, into a, into a disaster in many situations. Yeah, and a lot of the time people manage their way out of it, either intentionally or not. But by the time it ends up on my desk, it's definitely a mess. So, it, and I, because I see messes every day, I don't see a lot of the, the successful projects these times. So, it's just, <laughs> that's exactly right. Yeah, uh, I'll get to see all the happy people signing up new deals, and I get to spend time with the frustrated people that just want to get to the end. Back end, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I've worked in the front end as well over many years, and so I've seen it. Um, but now it's just at the back end. I tend to be, uh, I said, I see where the disputes have, have arisen from. So how do you how do you think? If have you got any sort of early views on sort of the COVID um, the COVID consequences that we're going to see here? Because clearly. You know, from what I'm reading, productivity, even though the construction industry is kept, you know, productivity is probably is down. I mean, maybe productivity was up around about 70%. So at some point of time, somebody is going to be adding up what time has done to them. <laughs> uh, and whether they're going to hold it, if you're a principal or an upstream person, whether you're going to hold somebody accountable for it uh, beneath you. Um, or if you're, you know, trying to argue variations or whatever it is, you know, I mean, time is going to, manifest itself at some point of time, I would think, on an increasing basis mm. in respect to the contracts that are on, were on foot at the time this crisis hit. I'm probably hoping and expecting to see maybe some new contracts in the future that will sort of you know, be able to accommodate this scenario a little bit more gently if I'm, if I'm, in terms of liquidated damages and delay costs. But the current contracts on foot, that, how that's going to play out really worries me in terms of at some point, of, everyone's talking nicely at the moment, but I reckon there's going to be some day of reckonings coming up. Mm. Yeah, I'd agree. And it's not that far away, I don't think. Yeah, so when it's starting to hit the bottom line, really hit the bottom line, that's, uh, that's when the disputes will arise. And uh, that's when it'll get very interesting. I think the latter half of this year and early next year is going to be an interesting time in how people behave. You're right, it's about the contracts that are currently on foot, not the ones about to be let, but the ones that were substantially on foot before this hit, that they were out of design and actually on the ground being built when this, this uh, crisis arose. Yeah. What about Ian putting your mediator's hat on and looking at the COVID situation? We had a chat with Sarah who um, is operating out of the UK and with Jeremy in Dubai on the Essential Series. And there's a, a theme that's arising out of the UK about trying to uh, find a way to deal with dispute issues off the back of the COVID consequences in a way that is, um, you know, more aligned with a mediation scenario of going in and having a conversation with people and trying to find and work a way through issues rather than retreating to your respective corners and just 
only ever seeing each other again once you show up to court. Do you have any views about whether you think there'll be an increased take up in mediation arising out of the crisis or, or where you think um, disputes will head? You know, it'll depend on the parties, but I, I would hope that the, the parties are going to be sensible about it and they might go down the routes of uh, like uh, dispute boards or they could well end up in uh, similar to uh, an alliancing situation where you have a group at a management level and a construction level working together, even if it's on a without prejudice basis. Um, so it doesn't necessarily set the contract aside, but it might provide uh, a venue for these things to be sorted out before they escalate into formal disputes. I would hope that that would be the case at uh, those sort of things will, uh, will come out of it. Like DABs and DARBs have been uh, gaining popularity. Mm. They can be quite efficient, can be sometimes. Sometimes act like uh, arbitration, but most of them work pretty well. So hopefully mm. that's at the end of it as well. Jeremy was saying that in Dubai, was it the Commonwealth Games project, Michael? that he was working on, that they were using a dispute board and that it had been quite effective, uh, but that in Dubai, mostly the disputes will proceed to um, an arbitration. Special, they've got special sort of court processes too, haven't they, or special court that... that mm. if, um, yeah, I think sometimes when it comes to disputes, culture has a plays a, plays a role in terms of how compliant people are going to be when someone steps in the middle to uh, to uh, come up with a decision. Um, I think so. money and efficiency as well. A lot of clients choose to go through adjudication process with us because I can, as the advisor, can give some kind of certainty around what period of time their resources are going to be used up in it. And for us, some kind of idea about the ballpark we're going to be in for fees as well, for mm. legal fees. So I think um, businesses want more certainty around what time and what money is it going to cost me to get to any kind of result, let alone a result that might be favourable for us. Yeah. I think, they I think also this... want me to be able to, you know, be a, reach out to people like King Planning or expert advisors outside of just the legal advisors um, and put together, you know, a, a dispute team that's going to be able to cover off all of the issues that are involved in, in the issue, in the dispute. In all the years that I've sort of been around here, the, the one sort of dominant thought I always come back to is how people have always clamoured for someone to independent, doesn't matter who they are, what hat they're wearing, someone independent to come in and sort the crap out. You know, they get to a point where they just want somebody, you know, as long as that person's got some sort of credibility, most times businesses will say, okay, this is the only way, this is the only way we're going to break this, this deadlock by someone independently coming in and, and, and sorting it out. And I always remember a person who's an experienced arbitrator as well as an experienced adjudicator. Back to your point about quickness, Janelle, saying to me, I reckon I get a, about, you know, a rat, a right about 80% of the time in adjudication and about 80% of the time in arbitration. And the extra time, and the point he was making, the extra time I get in arbitration doesn't mean that I come up with any better decisions. So it's just, his point was, sometimes you just need people to come in there quickly, sort it out. It might be imperfect, but it means that parties can sort of know where, what the consequences are and go on with life. Um, and I think that's the beauty of adjudication when you strip it back. Ian, as an expert, you get involved in arbitration, court, adjudication, all the ons. Yes, yep, yep, all the ahs and ons and expert <laughs> bits, yes. Any that are held dearly to your heart, but more so than others? Oh, not particularly. They've got their own, they've each has got their own place. And I think you're right again, the, uh, for adjudication, it's, um, it's quick, relatively. Um, mm. Uh, only in a um, encapsulates a number of key disputes. It can resolve them quickly. But the downside of it is that if clients get their nose out of joint and you need to go and work with them further down the track, there might be some commercial imperatives around that. But mind you, taking a client to arbitration or to court isn't exactly friendly either. Mm. So it's, it's a matter of how do you deal with that. 
uh, but I don't have any particular uh, because they're quite different in, in um, what's produced. I said adjudication is quick, relatively speaking. Um, it's still based around the facts, but lesser so. It's um, there's no opportunity really for like cross examination and those sorts of things as you would in an arbitration or in court. Um, but again, it's it's months compared to years, and that's what I think a lot of people don't realise is that arbitration and uh, and litigation is years a prospect, whereas an adjudication is months. So it's quite different. Yeah. Do you have you ever had situations? You know, adjudication it's considered to be an interim decision. So I've seen some big battles mm. where I've always wondered. I wonder really if every scenario the losing party has just willingly walked away or have they exercised their legal con contract rights and say, say they've paid the money or something like that, but then they've tried to have another crack through the, through the contractual and legal options. Have you ever represented a party who has done that? or um, They've started, but I, I've not seen any that have actually finished in, and in terms of the challenge because uh, the funny thing with adjudication, particularly in Queensland, because we're out there, you can see the results. Um, it, I think um, uh, jaundice people's views on what their success may be in taking it further. But if somebody's very confident going into our our adjudication, for instance, and then comes out the other end, not quite as uh, expected, you can tend to temper their view and they might be just prepared to walk away thinking, well, maybe this isn't a lay down misere after all. Mm. And, and by the same token, the, the party in receipt of it may well also think about, well, maybe we need to get this sorted out um, if they go down, uh, at least in part in an adjudication, if anything else arises rather than taking it further. Yeah. It can depend on how much money they've blown with their lawyers in the process as well and how weary they are. Um, to continue on, although it is an interim process, it often does lead to a commercial resolution afterwards that settles everything between the parties because although it can be um, efficient, it is very intense and can still be over very substantial amounts of money even though it is a very quick process. So there's been some monumentally large disputes that have been pushed through the adjudication process. Mm. So there can often be a large amount of money at stake. Yeah. One of the one of the things that you know I was involved, as you know, Jill, but in one busy in terms of the establishment of the, the cyber adjudication back in two thousand and four. And it was always originally going to be it was always considered it would only be the little subbies. It would only be the small disputes that would and I quite frankly when I look at it now it's probably why the big and the town didn't burr up initially because they never thought it was going to impact upon them. But what happened almost right from day one was that people were so dissatisfied with the existing alternatives mm. that they they saw adjudication as a means to, okay, we will make it into something like, you know, hundred day arbitration or expert determination. We'll 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 put the square peg in the round hole and we'll knock off the edges the best we can and we'll come up with something because we need something better than what the alternative is. And I don't think that was ever, ever envisaged when it was first established. Clever lawyers keep pushing the boundaries of what the words of that legislation mean, which is... They do, don't they? Well. <laughs> it was, a, was a Holland's dispute, I think, was one of the first big ones. Uh, it, was, it used to drive me... when you know The likes of Janelle's art and craft used to drive me mad when I was in, in the adjudication registry, but now it's a different world, of course. <laughs> Ian, you've said to me before that you think that um, the construction industry should play a short game but think long. What do you mean by that? I, I think that um, people have got to maintain their relationships within the contract and the confines of the contract, but maintain their contractual rights as they, they're doing that. It doesn't have to necessarily be adversarial but it need, they need to make sure that they're, they're maintaining their rights under the contract both ways, both from a principal and a contractor's view. So play it long, uh, play it short, but keep in mind that the long game might be there. So you might not necessarily have to go the long, long game, but you have to be prepared just in case it happens. There's this thing about the early parts of the project. 
everybody's getting along. It's the honeymoon, everybody's very excited, everybody's charging along. Then something happens, you know, it's not quite going as smoothly as it as it was going. Things start to deteriorate a bit. You need to maintain that you've got your rights sorted out as things are going along and not think about it six months down the track when you're trying to either make or break a claim down the track. Couldn't agree more. We have another question from the floor for you, Ian. When negotiating contracts, we as a contractor always try to own the float, but we often hit problems when trying to make clients understand that we are entitled to EOTs even in the event we may be ahead of program. Do you have any advice on how to best explain this to a client? Um, other than being a legal question in a lot of respects, uh, how I usually deal with it is that if it's under a typical contract that we have like 4,000, it'll be a delay to practical completion. They need to educate that, that the client that it's not a delay to the date for practical completion, which is definitive about how you calculate liquidated damages, et cetera. The contracts speak of delays to practical completion. Even though you may be ahead of schedule, that shouldn't be a disadvantage if you're subsequently delayed. Uh, it's, it's, and I understand the conundrum from a principal's perspective. They think, well, you're going to finish early, so where's your damage? But that could well be your commercial right to be able to finish early. And who's to say when the delay occurs and you're targeting to finish early, you don't eventually finish later than the date for, because it's, programs are forecasts. So mm -hmm. inherently an estimate, so things change along the way. So I usually try and focus on practical completion as opposed to the date for and get that explanation across the line wherever possible. But it is a challenge. I've heard you speak before about there being two purposes for extension of time claims as well. Can you just talk us through what you mean by that? That aligns well with the previous question from, from the floor. <clears throat> That's about practical completion. So you'll have two purposes. One, the first purpose and the primary purpose of extension of time is, is relief from liquidated damages and managing the date for. So that's it's basically a principal initiative. So that um, the time isn't at large, you can extend the date, and uh, you won't. The contractor isn't exposed to uh, delay damages as a result of a prevention issue from the principal side of the fence. The alternative to that is is cost. Now this can get a little bit tricky depending on the contract form. Because some contracts speak of actual cost, which means an actual delay versus you might have an extension of time clause which speaks of a prospective view, which means an impact or a future cause. Because what the best sort of practice is, is that you should sort extensions of time out as you go. You don't wait till the end. It's not a wait and see approach. You do them along the way. So there's actually two purposes around extensions of time and delay clauses, but they sometimes can be in conflict. One might be prospective, but one yet, might be a retrospective view or a wait till the delay has ceased to be able to define what the actual cost is. Depends on the contract. Excellent. Is there, in the projects um, that are currently on foot, so uh, we will have um, guests in the Zoom and on the Facebook Live who have projects that are on foot today that have um, provisions in their contracts which did not ever contemplate a situation that they're faced with today. If you were to give one practical tip or takeaway for those that are listening in, what would be your one practical tip for those people that are leading those projects um, and facing the, the challenges moving forward. Set up your systems for collecting your as-built records, which is site daily diaries, which are specifically recording, not just uh, where problems are, but what work you are doing. Photographs, annotated photographs, daily if possible. Recording the labour force and, and how things are being uh, rolled out and progressed between the trades 
and make sure your notices go in as you go along. So that's more than one, but. <laughs> There's a few gems We've there. We've an innovation series as well, Ian, where we look at new technology in the construction industry, um, new ways of doing old things, um, uh, and we introduce the opportunity for those who have new ideas for disrupting the construction industry to come and pitch those ideas to our clients and to open doors for them uh, and also allow the opportunity for those who are running companies who might not have access to these new ideas or for them to keep the finger on, their finger on the pulse of what might be up and coming. Is there any piece of technology or anything that you have particularly enjoyed using in your neck of the woods that um, you would give any tips for people to take a look at? Um, there's, there's two things that uh, have evolved over my experience. One is programming software and you know, Microsoft Project and P6 and those ones, um, but people have to use them properly and regularly, not just at the beginning of a project. And the other one I think is the biggest innovation for us is digitization of photos and, and phones. Like everybody has a phone in their hand, everybody, and how that can that information can be collected really easily and then transmitted such that it can be kept as a, a live record. I think that's one of the biggest innovations we could uh, possibly have. I, feel like I, I remember film, so. Microfilm. <laughs> 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 well, Ian, I think that we've run out of time. Uh, did you have anything else that you'd like to contribute, Michael, before I close out? No, I just apologise for that early whatever happened to me before, but just everyone should note that I, technology guru I am, I worked my way through it. We've come a long way, mate. We're live on Facebook and we're in Zoom. <laughs> so whoever said you can't teach an old dog new tricks, you've proved them to be a liar. Thank you, Janelle. <laughs> Well, Ian, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk with you. You are a fountain of knowledge and we really appreciate you sharing that knowledge with the Helix team uh, and also with our guests that have joined us this afternoon. So thank you very much. We look forward to continuing to work with King Planning at Helix Legal. Um, we've enjoyed working with you over a number of years now. So thank you very much to you and your team to contributing to the Essential Series. We very much appreciate it. Thank you very much and Thanks, uh, you're very welcome and um, hope we can talk again. Thanks, Lovely. Mike. Thank you ever, very much to everyone who's joined us this afternoon. The Essential Series goes live on Facebook every Wednesday at four o'clock. You can get further information about the guests that we have appearing in the coming weeks from our Facebook page, our LinkedIn page, our Instagram page, or our website. So the information is out there for the taking. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks again, Ian, and thank you very much, Michael. Have a great night. Thank you. Thanks, guys.